I'm here right now with Dr. Charles Prober from Stanford Medical School, and, and what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about uh, principles of antibiotic prescribing that physicians should follow when they're treating a child or an adult with a presumed bacterial infection. And just to be clear, because this is something I see confusion all the time in my own family, antibiotics are for bacteria. Very important point. Yes, antibiotics are for bacteria, either approved bacterial infection or one you really suspect is bacterial. They are not for viruses. Exactly. Very different things, and there are other videos on the Khan Academy about the difference. Perfect. <laughs> So, so, so uh, sorry, I interrupted you. No, so we're going to, the general principles, we're going to, the first general principle when you uh, are contemplating treating a bacterial infection is you first have to figure out where you think the infection is. Where in the body do you think the infection is? Is it in the ears? Is it in the lungs? Is it in the blood? Is it in the bones? And there are a variety of other places, but that is the first uh, general principle. The second general principle is based upon the first, and that is what are the likely bacteria that cause infection at the site that I've been thinking about? So, for example, in the ears, the likely bacteria are very limited. There's only three. One is called pneumococcus. 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 I'm going to help you spell that. P N E U. M O C U Uh oh no I mean O oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, the C yes. should be an O. Numo C O C O C O C C C C U S U S Pneumococcus. Pneumococcus. Exactly. Now we if the fancy name is Streptococcus pneumoniae, but it's called pneumococcus by its friends. A second bacteria is non typable for ears, second bacteria in ear infections, oh, is no, non-typable haemophilus. Non-typable haemophilus. Non-typable haemophilus. So non-typable? Non-typable. Typable, like that? I think it might be an E in there, but that's close enough. And <laughs> haemophilus, H-A-E-M-P-H-O-L-I-S. I-O-L. I S non typable haemophilus, and the third bacteria is called Moraxella catarrhalis. M O R A X E L L A catarrhalis. C A T H. C I'm sorry. C A T H A R L I S. L I S. <laughs> There's actually two R's, but one's enough for that one. And that yeah. the last one, perfect. Okay. And that's abbreviated MCAT, which students love to hear. <laughs> MCAT. So those are the three bacteria that cause ear infections. And again, a second general principle is if we think we're, is to know that we're dealing with an ear infection. That's principle one. Second principle, what are the likely bacteria? And we've just listed those for an ear infection. Then the third principle is to know what those bacteria that we've just listed uh, are likely killed by what antibiotics kill them? So, so, so I, 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 this is probably a silly question, but how do we know right from the get-go that it is a bacterial infection? Can you have a viral ear infection? A great question, actually. And most ear infections do start off with a virus sort of setting the stage. Mm. So a child has a cold uh, caused by a virus. The virus changes the fluid dynamics in the ear space the fluid ends up accumulating in that so-called middle ear space. Oh, okay. That accumulated fluid is a, is a nice growth place for bacteria that come into the ears backwards from the pharynx. Not to be confused with the larynx. Not to be confused with the larynx, <laughs> the pharynx. I think that might be an inside joke. And so it comes into the ears from the pharynx and then the bacteria grow and by the time the child has symptoms that are suggesting an ear infection, the bacteria are usually well established. All right. So, so when people talk about ear infections, it's it's pretty much they're talking about a bacterial infection. That is correct. Oh, cool, cool. All right. Sorry, I interrupted. 
So that's great. So there's, so there's the three bacteria that cause the ear infection. The third principle, uh, sticking with ear infection as an example, I think, is that we have to know what are the likely antibiotics that kill the bacteria causing the infection at this particular site because that's going to help us choose it. So we want to know what antibiotics will kill the bacteria causing infection at the site, in this case, the ear infection. And is the antibiotic dependent on just the type of bug or bacteria it is, or is it also a combination of the bug and the location? It's, uh, it depends on the bug specifically, um, but the sensitivity, that is the likelihood that the bacteria will be sensitive, will be killed by the antibiotic, varies from geographic location mm -hmm. to geographic location. So it, it in order to adequately treat, appropriately treat an infection in California, specifically at our hospital, Packard Children's Hospital, it's important for us to know the sensitivity of the bacteria in California at Packard. Okay, so you, oh, I, I misunderstood. So when you're saying geography, you literally mean geography, like California versus Louisiana versus, you know, England, it, as opposed to geography in the body. Precisely. So that's the third principle that we need to know what we call the local pathogen or local bacteria sensitivities. What, what in that physical locality, California, uh, what antibiotics will likely kill that particular bacteria. So that's, that's the third principle. And a pathogen is just like anything that's bad. That's correct. A pathogen is, is a word for uh, something which causes problems. That's a good point. The fourth principle is that we need to understand uh, what is referred to as drug kinetics. That is how the drug, in this case antibiotic, uh, gets around the body and in what concentrations, how much, gets to different sites of the body. So in the example that we've been using here, the ear infection, we'd want to be sure to look at antibiotics that actually get into the ear space, the middle ear space, so that they can do their thing. So at least that part of drug kinetics we need to understand, how they penetrate different parts of the body. And how are these drugs going to be delivered? Are they going to be uh, pills or are they going to be like IVs or injections? So it depends on the uh, severity of the infection and the site of infection. So ear infections generally may cause a child misery in terms of making them cry and causing them to have a fever, but will not make the child particularly at risk of serious consequences. So that's not a serious infection and is treated invariably then by an oral route. A child takes a liquid or a pill or a capsule. And that's just because it's not as serious. It's, 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 you don't have to, you don't want to inject them if, if they're not going to die from this type of thing. Precisely. It's not as serious, so you can, you can use a, a different, a, a route that takes their time in getting the antibiotic into the bloodstream and into the ear. Contrast that with somebody who, let's say, has something called sepsis, bacteria in their blood, and maybe they're in shock. Their blood pressure is falling, and that's a serious infection. That's a life. And, and, and shock is a medical term. It's not like shock, like shock, shock. It's, it... So in the case, yes. So shock is uh, is a medical term. In in medical lingo, shock means a very low blood pressure, insufficient blood being pushed through the body to maintain your vital organs and your function. Oh, cool. I didn't know that. So that's so understanding drug kinetics is important. One. One part of drug kinetics is how the drugs get to the site of the infection, or if they get to the site of the infection. Other parts of drug kinetics that we consider uh, include the so-called half-life of the drug. That is, how long the drug, how long it takes for the drug to be reduced by half in, in the body. And that's called the half-life, whether it's two hours or four hours or 24 hours. And the reason the half-life is important is that that helps determine how frequently the patient is prescribed, how frequently the patient takes the medication they're prescribed. Right, and, and, and how long it takes them to get a, a kind of a, a, the steady state concentration, or the concentration that you want. Precisely. That's, that's exactly true. So that knowing the half-life is important. And there's other aspects of drug kinetics, but these are the most important ones. And generally, we... we don't need to memorize the specific kinetics of a drug. There are books uh, that one can refer to for that. And the dosing recommendations for antibiotics take into account these drug kinetic factors. Okay, very cool, very cool. 
So the next uh, and the fifth of, uh, of six general principles is that one should anticipate as the prescribing physician the drug adverse effects, the side effects of the drugs. And the reason, of course, you want to anticipate the drug side effects is so that you can tell the patient uh, or the patient's family what they might expect if the drug is, is having a side effect. So, for example, many antibiotics cause diarrhea. Mm. And it's terrific to advise the family that their child may develop some diarrhea so that they won't think that that's another problem. I can't right. spell diarrhea, sorry. I'm, oh, diarrhea is a... Yes, it's... Diarrhea is a tough word to spell, actually. It's D-I-A-R-R-H-E-A. -R -R -E Very good. I think. <laughs> so that's... So, and there are many side effects to... Uh, and different side effects for different antibiotics, but knowing and understanding the side effects is important. I also think a side effect of any drug and antibiotic specifically is cost. Um, so I think a prudent physician, a uh, physician who is prudently prescribing the antibiotics should consider cost. It would be better to use a drug that the patient can afford that is effective than a drug that the patient cannot afford. And oftentimes, physicians have not become familiar with some of the extraordinary costs of these agents. So having a pharmacist that they can call and check it out is, I think, valuable. Very cool. So, so I guess, is, 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 is that kind of a good starting point? Well, and there's one, fin oh, yeah, there's yeah. one final, number six of six, uh, which is a, a general principle that I like to advise our students and residents about, is that they should limit their what I call personal formulary. That is, limit the number of antibiotics that they are likely to prescribe to their patients, as opposed to prescribing a different antibiotic to every patient. The problem with prescribing a different antibiotic to every patient is the physician doesn't acquire a familiarity with the antibiotic. And in general, uh, that familiarity translates to maybe not doing the best thing for the whole for the for the physician's whole patient population. So I think that knowing a lot about a few antibiotics that are key is better than knowing a little or nothing about a lot of antibiotics. No, no, it makes a ton of sense. I actually n never thought about this one. That actually makes makes a ton of sense. Great. So those are the general principles of antibiotic prescribing, and then there are, there are two phases when antibiotics are prescribed. And one phase is you're making a decision when the patient first comes to your office or the emergency department or is admitted to the hospital. And at that phase, you're making the decision based upon a thoughtful history, a physical examination, and an analysis of, of what's going on with the patient at that point in time. But what you don't know in this decision-making process is what the actual bacteria is that's causing the infection. You're guessing. You're guessing based upon knowledge, but you're guessing. And that's, again, a, an educated guess. And we call this phase of therapy uh, the, the empiric therapy or the initial therapy. Sometimes tests are done to try to guide that therapy. Uh, cultures may be taken. Other blood tests may be done, uh, but that is really what's driving that initial therapy. And if the initial therapy ends up being correct, that is, oh yes, the patient really does have an ear infection, and they really don't have any other problem, and the bacteria that I thought they had is probably true because the antibiotic that I prescribed seems to be working because they're getting better, then that's the therapy that you continue with. However, if it's a more serious infection or the patient is not getting better, you have to reevaluate constantly and make a decision about changing therapy. So that would be the reassessment phase of therapy. Reassessment. Reassessment. Two S's and then another one for good measure. There may, I, there may only be, well, I'm not sure. There may be an extra S in there, but I'm not sure about that. Yes, I think there is. Well, but I'm not, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll put a question mark there. <laughs> And the reassessment of therapy is based upon how the patient is doing. And also, there may be laboratory tests that you've obtained that have now come back that help guide that reassessment phase. So, 
for example, if one thought the patient had sepsis, mm. that with shock that we talked about yeah. earlier, a blood culture will have been obtained. Mm. And if the blood culture comes back positive for a particular bacteria, the modification of therapy would optimize to treat that particular bacteria. Yeah, no, it makes complete sense. Then you, right, and this would give you some information on the actual bacteria that you're dealing with. Exactly, and then that would drive the, the further selection or refinement of the antibiotics that you had originally prescribed empirically. Cool, cool, very neat. So those are the general principles of antimicrobial therapy that I like to follow and advise our students and residents to follow as they approach their patients. No, no, this is useful. I, I feel, I feel vaguely, vaguely. In, uh, well, I, I have a long way until I fully understand all of this, but this is a good beginning for me, at least. <laughs> well, we hope as a consumer that you will never need to have this knowledge. <laughs>